Good morning and welcome to the Vermont Legislature's House Committee on Environment and Energy. This morning we're going to take up H126, an act relating to community resilience and biodiversity protection. And our first witness is Ed Larson with the Vermont Forest Products Association. Welcome, Mr. Larson. It's been a few years. You're in person? Be here in person. Yeah. Take it in for a second. <laughs> wow. You okay. were here last year? I think you were here last year. I didn't testify. Though. Okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Guys, I already made up your minds and I wasn't going to try to just change it. <laughs> How'd they go? I'll add that for later. I think you testified in my former, in my former committee. I'm sorry? I think you testified in my former committee last In the energy, yes, I did, on Rygate and a couple other things. Yeah. Uh, so good morning, I'm Ed Larson. Uh, I'm here representing the Vermont Forest Products Association. It's, uh, we're in our 46th year and uh, started 1979 with uh, the name of the Vermont Timber Truckers and Producers Association. And uh, their whole mission was to try to fix challenges with workers' comp and trucking. We're still wrestling with those two issues today, but they brought them together. Right around 1991, uh, we broadened, uh, our, our membership was broadening to sawmills and foresters, and landowners and all kinds of groups. So we changed the name to the Vermont Forest Products Association to be more inclusive. And uh, I've been their lobbyist uh, for the better part of 25 years. Uh, and I have been lobbying in this building for 32 years. Saw something that- That was a, yeah. Well, I couldn't get it. <laughs> Nope. Anyways, I'm going to be the skunk at your party here on this bill. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of the Vermont Forest Products Association. Uh, in addition to being a lobbyist, I'm also licensed as a consulting forester. I live here in Montpelier and operate in Central Vermont. It flew off. I also teach forestry at Vermont Tech College. And uh, that's a thrill, working with young people that are interested in our industry. Um, so. Before I get into the bill, I want to just make a few comments and statements, uh, mostly in response to some of the things that you have heard in the last couple of weeks. Um, forest management protects and enhances tree health, forest health, biological diversity. We protect water quality, and we prove it every year. Wildlife habitat, carbon storage and sequestration, and resiliency to climate change. And to boot, the landowner can get a return on their investment in addition to all the other benefits they receive by owning a piece of Vermont. Now, forest management and logging does not cause forest fragmentation. Logging does not exacerbate flooding, but we do it right, and we do it better every year. And we do not degrade water quality or water quantity. I'll make another statement. Probably not heard this one before. More carbon is stored and sequestered in sustainably managed forest than in any old growth forest unmanaged for timber over time. I'll say it again, a different way. More carbon is stored and sequestered for the long term on managed forest than any wilderness, forever wild easement, forest reserve, or core area. We can prove it. Now, silviculture is the science that foresters use. And that's what we were, we were trained at. Silviculture is a science of understanding forest succession and how forests respond to disturbances. It has a bit of an artful flair because of the, the variability in our forests. There's, there's no two acres alike on this planet. <clears throat> Every acre you encounter, you're seeing different things. So you need to have some flexibility in silviculture as far as understanding what you got, what you want, and how to get there. <clears throat> Forestry profession has always been evolving as we learn, we adapt. You need not go far to see for yourself. Vermont has lots of forests that are healthy, strong, and vibrant. And it's that way because of us, not in spite of us. Currently, there are 238 licensed foresters operating in Vermont. That amounts to about one forester for every 20,000 acres. Now, if you just go to the 2 million acres that are enrolled in current use, which for most of us are, are spending most of our time, uh, you're looking at about 8,500 acres, okay? Now, my little business, I'm very part-time as a consulting forester because I spend more time doing this work. Uh, 
I'm doing more than 10,000 acres. So um, I challenge, I, I mean, I would be surprised if there's any other state or any other jurisdiction worldwide that has that kind of concentration of professional trained foresters managing forests. So I'm going to now show you a slide here. So now I get to share. <clears throat> What you're looking at here is a graph. It's a line graph. Pictures just make it a lot easier to tell the story. This is a line graph depicting uh, a forest succession. And uh, the, the, the lines that go through that kind of describe what is happening during the various stages of succession. Uh, you'll see uh, the bottom line there is the number of years. And then just above it is some letters. Uh, G is a gap. Those are the number of years that a forest is kind of recovering from some kind of a disturbance. Could be a forest fire, could be a clear cut, could be any kind of activity. Could be a silvicultural activity or it could be a, a natural disaster. R is regeneration. So after a few years, soil sta stabilized, um, seed starts to develop and you have trees growing. E is early successional. EO is, um, they use the word optimum in this graph. Um, that's early optimum, M is middle optimum, and then L is late optimum. And you can see that we're right about 100 years now with our forest between 80 and 100 years. So we're still in the early optimum stage for the bulk of our forests. But we're moving quickly into MO. Um, then you'll notice P, that's a funny word. It's planter. Um, it's a Latin word, and it kind of talks about, it's into the, and I'm not an expert on this, but it gets into equalization. It's at that point where the, the, the trees are just too old and they start to die and they start to decay. And then you get into T where you're looking at now possible transitions and then D is decay. Um, now this is assuming that there's no disturbances along that whole timeline. So if you look at the lines, you can see timber stock and leaf area, how that grows with as the trees grow larger, you increase timber stock. Um, the other one, sunlight on floor and deadwood volume uh, is just kind of the opposite. One, because as the trees grow and they fill up the upper canopy, you have shade. And by the shade, you lose then those types of species that are sun loving and cannot tolerate shade. So you see how the mix types of diversity changes over time. Now, if you go to the bottom graph, producers, consumers, saprophyllic, and I, I don't want to get into all the details of these organisms, but those are organisms that prey on uh, dead matter. And then the other one, saprotrophs, those are organisms that, that feed on living matter. So you can see how they change over time, okay? So the timber stock and leaf area could also be your carbon graph. Okay, how it loads up carbon over the years, and then it goes into decline. Now, I am arguing that if we manage that forest, if we enter that forest every 20 or 30 years, thin out the trees, get more sunlight into the trees, you improve growing stock on the remaining trees, and you can stimulate new regeneration and start a new, new generation. Um, keeps the forest healthy much longer. And we're adding carbon stock, where in other words, if we didn't, enter those stands every 25, 30 years. When you get to the end of the life cycle of a forest, you're losing your carbon. We can continue to keep storing carbon over time. We can manage in old forests. We do not object to old forests. We just feel that they should be managed. <clears throat> this is a little bit more of a description of it, maybe even a little clearer, because, but I got it so close. Yeah, Representative Sackowitz has a question. Sorry. Yeah, can we go back to the, the last slide? So I have some questions that, about it. Uh, so on the on the top graph, we have sunlight on floor and deadwood volume. And you're showing how it changes over time. Mm -hmm. um, you're, it's showing that after 300 years that it's just going up. Is it, is it just gonna keep going up um, forever that we're gonna, we're gonna get to a point where eventually there's, all, the sunlight is, 100%, that's what the graph seems to imply. It does uh, in both of the ends of the spectrum, yes. So, 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 so eventually the forest is just completely gone. 
because it's completely, there's no more forest there at all. If, you, well, if we just leave it alone. That's the, the challenge. If you leave it alone, it will come back, okay? But it will take a longer time because if you look at the R, the species in there, and maybe I can show you another graph really quickly that would tell you about it. These are the different tree, tree species that we manage in Vermont that have different tolerances to sunlight shade, okay? You can see that the intolerant trees, uh, the red pine, walnut, we don't have much walnut, but all the other species in there, we don't have a lot of jack pine either. But all those are early successional tree species. They come in first and they grow faster, but they're short-lived. So if you, um, if you were to go to the 300 to 500 years, those trees would not be there, okay? So that seed would not be there. And the intermediate and the taller trees take longer to germinate, take longer to establish themselves in a wide open forest. When we do a clear cut, we're managing for those intolerant species. When we do selective thinning, just take out a tree here or there, we keep the stocking fairly, fairly tight. We're really favoring the, the shade taller trees, okay? That's part of silviculture. You gotta know what you got to know what you're gonna do to maintain the health of that forest. But you can see there's a lot fewer trees that are shade tolerant. So I can also argue biodiversity is enhanced in a managed forest better than it is in an old growth forest. You're hearing that we want biodiversity. You even have it in all your, in your bill and your findings and all that. Increased biodiversity. We do that. We do that. There aren't, there's nothing in the old for, growth forest that we, we have in, that we don't have in managed forests. Nothing. So you may have more of lichens in a, in a old growth forest, but we have them in managed forests too. And we can manage for them. Does that answer your question? Not completely. I'm just I'm just still puzzled because I know there are there are very old forests around still. There aren't very many, but there are some right. that are more than 300 years old. Exactly. Much more than that. And there there are trees. There's a canopy. I mean, there's there's not there's not <coughs> huge amounts of light. Um, getting to the forest floor, but your graph here seems to suggest that, that that wouldn't be the case. Well, this graph shows 300 years as the life of the forest. This is not a New England uh, forest that is being depicted here, but it is re a, a valid representative of a forest successional um, situation. Our forest, those trees you're talking about could be 300, 400 years old, but at about 450 years old, they're going to rapidly go into decline. There aren't many species that can live 500 years. Sugar maple, hemlock um, can do that, but all the other trees don't live that long. They just die away. And if you're lucky and they can get some seed on the ground before they go on, uh, usually at that age, they're not even seeding well. So that's why you're gonna have a period of time uh, of decay where it's hard to get that forest restarted unless we intervene and put something there. That's, but I mean, seeds, seeds travel long distances. Mm -hmm. When trees fall, they create openings that are, right. if it's a big tree, it can create a big opening. And so you have, all of a sudden you have, that's when you get more sunlight to exactly. the floor, but then you have this regeneration mm -hmm. that you're talking about, but that, that happens in old forests. That happens in all forests. Yeah, so I, I guess I still don't, I, I just feel like the, that, that the graph at the end there is really not giving us an accurate picture of what really happens in, forests. Well, uh, I don't know these scientists that have made the study, but their names are in there. And uh, um, I understand they've been uh, at this for quite a while and they're quite credible. So you know, I would argue that it, it is an accurate representation of how forests is, is, goes through succession and what happens. Um, I'm trying to make the argument that we can manage that. And, no, I understand. And, and understand benefit the from that. We're trying to make. I just... I just feel like these graphs are really misrepresenting, especially at the old end, what, what is my understanding really happens in forests. So right off. Um, can I just ask if you could mute your device? I'm trying, I don't know how to do it. Oh, with the yeah. echo. That's what I'm, I'm trying to mute this thing. Oh, you don't have barely focus. Yeah. <laughs> oh, here it is. I just got this. No, his face is not muted. Oh, still doing it. It is. So turn the speakers all the way down. <clears throat> yeah, if, if, if you could give us um, the reference where this graph came from, that would be great. Well, I use it in my lecture. Um, when I'm... But you, you said this, this was published somewhere that you got this from some scientists. 
Yeah, a group of scientists. This was a, a put together slide by a group of scientists. And I believe a professor out of um, Ohio State University. I have to go back and find it. Yeah, if you could get that reference for us, that would be great. So uh, you've been hearing from Jamie Fidel, bless his heart, for many years coming in talking about loss of forest. And uh, he's using some 11 to 12,000 acre per year volume. We don't believe it. We think it's wrong. If we were losing 11, 12,000 acres a year, we would take note. We aren't talking about that. We don't see that. Now I, you know, do see subdivisions take place. In, you know, in my little world, um, I had one farmer actually subdivide and break up his land. It happens, um, and it turned into three different pieces of land. But all three of them are still being managed. I don't call that loss of forest. Maybe a new house shows up. I lost two, three acres. We didn't lose forests. I think the number is more like 2,000, 2,500 a year at this point that we're losing, which is where the Forest Service is with their numbers. So, but if you want to talk about loss of forests, the last two years, we lost well over 15,000 acres to our industry through easements, through public ownership. Outside of Shittenden County, we don't see fragmentation. We don't see loss of forests. We actually see new forests coming. Um, but, you know, with these forever wild easements, um, Greenmont National Forest, Silvio County <coughs> National Wildlife Refuge, Agency of Natural Resources, and the Nature Conservancy keep buying up land. And it far exceeds the amount of land that the state is losing, that we're losing. So, um, so if you combine these th three things, the loss of access to manage high quality, high valuable trees, with these set aside instruments. The ranch that we're hearing from some pretty outrageous folks coming here to disparage this industry with misinformation. And the narrative that's underscored in this legislation, it's no wonder this industry is less optimistic about our future. Um, this industry is being forced to right size to the available timber base. <clears throat> so um, my last slide. Representative Smith. Thank you. Ed, what are your thoughts on the management of uh, Conti and Sliding? Are they being managed correctly according to Vermont Forestry? How about the word analysis paralysis? They spend so much time thinking about what they want to do, planning, 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 and not implementing. So no, public lands are not well managed. They're getting crowded. We're getting sick. I, I understand that. So um, I want to say congratulations. Uh, in 2020, the University of Vermont did a study and has declared that Vermont has conserved one third of the land needed for ecologically functional future. Um, so we're there 10 years early. Now you're all here in 28%, 27%. I don't know. These are pretty smart people over there at UVM. You know, maybe you ought to get their people talking to your people and figure out who's right and who's wrong. But we see that. So you're there. We don't need this bill. Um, we have another question from Representative Sackowitz. Um, they're saying that we have <laughs> one third of the there. One third. one third of the land needed for an ecologically functional future. So if we want an ecologically functional future, we're one third of the way there. We're still two thirds of the we, land missing. Well, it, no, it, it says that you have 1.3 million acres under under conservation easements. I'm just going by, the, by, the, by what this headline By the headline, says. yeah. The headline says that, we've, we're, that we have concerned one third. So we're, we're, but, we're the first ways, sentence. We have a long ways to go is what that, that well, if you want 100 percent, but no, you, your bill says 30 no. percent. This says you're 33. No, we want, right, let's, we want to preserve 30 percent of of the of the natural <laughs> land, but this is saying that if we want an ecologically functional future, we are only one third of the way there. Well, that headline does say that. Yes. Yeah, but I'm it, guessing that the article says that. The article says that. Uh, Confirm. University of Vermont confirms that the state has already protected 33% or 1.3 million acres of highest priority targeted lands needed to protect and connect valuable wildlife habitats. Right. So we're one, third of, we're one third of the way there. 
If you want 100% of our force, yes. No, no, if we want 100% of what we need to have a psychologically functional future. Okay, well. Anyway, let's move on. Representative Clifford. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I guess I'm just, we've had a couple of foresters come in here and actually in favor of these bills. Uh, I didn't kind of understand what the conflict is, you know. Um, oh, you're talking about Charlie Hancock? Well, um, well to Montgomery, for one. he was in here what, last week? For one, but. Um, well, when I, as I go through the test rock, because now I'm going to get into H126, um, I have an assembly of thought from my association and my leadership, okay? Um, Forrester, you listened to last week, speaks for himself. He doesn't speak for an association representing an industry, okay? Uh, I like Charlie. I like him a lot. He's a great guy. Um, but he does not represent a consensus of the industry. We are, are on opposite sides of this particular bill and sometimes on other issues too. Uh, he, he supports working for us like we do, um, but there are just some things that we don't agree on. So um, but I just wanna point out that he represents himself. He's not representing any you know, group of folks. Right. And as I go through this testimony, you'll see that I'm bringing in several minds because some of the language is not my language, it's kind of what other people have been <laughs> telling me too as we go through this and their concerns. Representative Stebbins has a question. Thanks, Madam Chair. It's a question, so you can tell me to be quiet. Um, I guess I just want to flag, you know, as, as someone who um, is a co-sponsor on this bill, mm -hmm. um, I very much value silver culture and, and the practice of our foresters. And I, I just for the record, I don't the intent here was not to be disparaging, as I think you put it, um, to your industry. If anything, I think your industry, if anything, I think your industry um you know, is incredibly critical to maintaining the Vermont that we know. So I just want to put that out there that I, I don't think the intent is to be attacking your industry. And I, I'm sensing that you're feeling that. And I personally, that was not my intent by signing on to this bill. And, and my um, um, concern about the uh, rant that we're hearing is not coming from you or the General Assembly. I'm from our restaurants. Okay. So that, you know, that's, that's clear. Okay. But that does put undue pressure on it. See, silviculture is influenced by three major influences. It's the ecology, it's the economy, and then it's society. And we find that equilibrium as we manage. And we are pulled and pressured, okay? So society has a way of putting a lot of pressure on us. And if it's too much pressure, then the economy suffers, or and the ecology suffers. If there's a, a real problem in the economy, and we have one right now, we can't find markets for uh, pulp grade softwood. Okay, all we have are two biomass plants that we can go to, and a pe two pellet mills, uh, and they're kind of far away. And, um, and and there's no paper anymore, although we can go to Ticonderoga, and we do go all the way to Rumford. Um, but because the economy is so affected. Uh, we are so affected by that. The ecological balance is in, in, at risk because now we are leaving trees in the woods that we otherwise would take out. And that could have a genetic consequence for the next generation, things like that. So as a silviculturalist, we try to find those sweet spots, that balance, so that everything is kind of functioning. But it does get out of whack quite a, quite a few times. And I'm trying to prevent that on the social side. I just also need to do a little bit of time check because we do have other witnesses scheduled for the morning. Well, I, I do have a little bit more, but I can I want to go through. Well, yeah, I want to hear you. I just want to give the room a heads up. Okay. Well, this legislation is unnecessary. As I said, it sets random artificial goals for conservation. Uh, if you look at the already existing conservation accomplishments, um, we, we, we're good for another eight years. Permanent conservation measures are not necessary. There is well over 50% of our forest under some conservation plan. The use value appraisal program is the most important conservation program we have uh, with our rules for en en enrollment and participation compared to other stats, states uh, with their similar current use programs. UVA, UVA is very robust and not all that easy to leave. 
Therefore, we argue that longer range horizons for sustainable forestry naturally occur on those lands. And I don't see a lot of land coming out. Uh, when you go into the current use program, you're really committed and uh, you don't want to take anything out. And, but they should be able to if they need to. And I usually see when they fix them out so that they need to, they have a financial hardship uh, it, or they want to provide a, a building lot for a child. Um, I don't see people jumping out and, and moving straight into development. Um, I know what happens. I, I haven't experienced that myself, but um, for the most part, I would argue current use lands is conserved and should meet the definition of conservation. Doesn't need to be permanent. But it's real, and there's a lot of it, and it's well managed. So the concept of the legislature setting a predetermined percentage of the landscape will be counterproductive to well-planned and coordinated land conservation. This is especially true when it includes a predetermined management philosophy for those targets. You know, Vermonters don't take too well the to top-down planning. Uh, I don't know if you remember. Some of you might remember back in the 1990s, we had a, a, a thing called the Council of Regional Commissions. Court. Governor Howard Dean abolished court, and Vermonters cheered. They don't like statewide top-down plan. They want to wrestle and argue and fight over conservation in their towns, and they tolerate the regional commissions because they do some reasonable things to put things together. Some towns are cohesive to each other, but they don't want to go any further than that. So they're not going to be really happy when they see that um, words coming down from above on how things are going to look in their backyard. So just consider that. Uh, I have 10 years as a commissioner representing Montpelier on the Regional Planning Commission, so I'm well aware of the mindset of this planning community, and I support what they do. And I like it local like they do. So think about that. Land conservation is presently accomplished through careful coordination of multiple state, federal, private, and nonprofit organizations working together in many ways. This legislation could complicate and hinder those current efforts. Good planning and public participation and involvement has been a cornerstone of Vermont's land conservation and management for many decades. This effort will circumvent that established process. The question, how will ANR determine what lands are allocated to what category of conservation? Based on the existing ANR public process, they will need a front load of all the planning on land allocation and management that is done now <coughs> after acquisition, not before. So they have to totally change your mindset as to how they're gonna write a plan. Um, things change. Land conservation takes many forms and evolves with social, economic, and ecological circumstances of the time. Again, those three circles um, affecting silviculture. Goals and approaches change as land use changes. We presently are in a time of significant change due to the global pandemic a post-pandemic lifestyle adjustment and worldwide economic and political instability. Setting goals and predetermined outcomes based on political desires is not responsive to a responsible approach. Um, the bill seeks to allocate parcels in the three types of conserved land based on Vermont conservation design. Vermont conservation design has not gone through any broad public discussion or public input from affected parties. Uh, how will it affect the town tax base? state tax income, school funding, affordable housing, and our industry, the sustainable working forest-based industries. And all landowners will be impacted by these initiatives. Um, now, you have heard in the past from commissioners and the secretary that conservation, Vermont conservation design is a tool that they have developed uh, internally to help guide their work, okay? They have asked to not make it a rule or a law or to build public policy around that. Um, so I think we need to be careful there. Again, we've had no opportunity to uh, understand it. The public does not know about it, uh, only what they've heard. And um, uh, so <clears throat> I think the goal of 50% by 2050 will be much more difficult. And I, I just, what's, what's gonna happen if you don't make that goal? 80% of the land is privately held. Um, easements are usually granted through by a willing seller and a willing buyer. Um, what are you gonna do? You know, I, I 
defend property rights. I'm one of the few that comes back to this building and defends property rights anymore. When I started, there were like five or six of us working together. It's only me now. I have to work on that and I defend property rights. And, and are you going to force a willing seller? We don't know yet. I think you need to hear from other people that could be affected by this. The League of Citizen Towns, planning commissions. I know Peter's here. That's good. I hope he represents the broad spectrum and try to explain to us why there are some planning commissions that don't like this. So. <clears throat> Since public lands are included, I'd like to know more from the uh, secretary on, uh, on how they're going to do it. Um, you haven't heard from the Forest Service yet. Now, the U.S. Forest Service um, is guided by federal law. Um, they don't have to follow state law. Um, you know, how are they going to respond to this? I know that the <coughs> supervisor works hard to respect state law, but uh, they could legally ignore it. Um, timelines. You know, just because a presidential executive order dictates 30 by 30, we are so close now. Why can't we take a breath, flush out the concerns that I've been talking about, and, uh, and really do good policy on how we can conserve. We're doing a good job the way we're going. Um, teach us, don't dictate to us. Okay. So our industry is your only hope to keep forest as forest, keep it strong, vibrant, and healthy. Um, we do not support this bill or its underlying policies. We would rather you focus your attention to the essential needs of the forest products industry. Imagine how we can capitalize on the unique situation we find ourselves in. We're one of four places on the planet with northern temperate type forests. And our forests are at a mature stage where we can really capitalize, become a wood mecca, okay? And still show that we are storing carbon, sequestering carbon, and that we are working on a long-term horizon. And we have a viable, healthy forest products industry who can and will keep our forests healthy, strong, and vibrant. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Oh, I have one more thing. I'm sorry. I just want to pass out a letter. Uh, it just came to me about two weeks ago. It's a, a letter signed by over 500. And uh, if you pass this down to Chair, I didn't copy all the signatures. There's over 500 scientists that have signed on to this letter. It basically is saying the exact same thing I just told you. Two here. Hmm? Two These are the letters. And then the thick one, just send that to the Chair. Or you have two thick ones. You can have them both. But uh, these are professors and research scientists from Europe uh, with a letter that goes to the European Commission president, the European Parliament president, and the European Council president, basically describing what we do. We are a circular bioeconomy, one of the few, circular bioeconomy. And they're making the point, just like I did, that sustainably managed forest is carbon neutral. And, um, and management did enhance the biodiversity in forests over time. And it definitely talks about, please do not create more wilderness. Uh, it is not climate smart. So don't believe me. Challenge these 500 scientists from Europe and Canada. Representative Smith. Well, I, I did, I've got a question, graduate. Also, a statement. Uh, I want to say this the right way. <clears throat> I don't want to single out the Northeast Kingdom, but you know, we talked about this the other day. We're we're forty three percent already. Forty three by twenty three. Uh, we're we're closer to fifty by thirty than than anybody else. Uh, the rest of the state, Chittenden County, eight percent right now. This bill is going to include the Northeast Kingdom. And I don't think these set of, this set of rules in here should pertain to a, an area of the state that's already existing and has met the requirements or requests, however you want to say it. But should we have uh, companies like maybe Colleen Goodrich from uh, Goodrich Lumber and Justin Taft from Charleston testify as to what they do to protect the property in the Northeast Kingdom? so that the rest of the state could learn by it? So I, I just need to actually correct the record here. So this is a plan. I feel like it actually will help address some of the concerns that you just brought before us. If you feel like you're losing access to viable tracts of forest land because of easements, this is gonna clear that up. This will 
this will this is a plan that includes an inventory that actually potentially picks up where the UVM study that you have cited leaves off and says like actually we do need more information. We we need to know where the lands are and how they're conserved. This is not telling anyone to do anything other than telling the agency to assess the state of conservation in Vermont today and come back to the legislature and tell us what's what's up what's happened out there. We've been doing conservation for 30 years and we have learned a lot in those 30 years. We've done a lot of great work, um, but it's been uh, potentially leaning towards one region of the state over another. We may be prioritizing and losing opportunities that we may be prioritizing in one place. We may be finished doing conservation in one part of the state. We may need to do more in another. It's really just a plan to do that. I understand that. Um, and I'm not arguing that. But if I look at the priorities that's in here, it looks scary from the industry point of view. Okay, It doesn't look like you're out to foster and enhance our abilities and opportunities. It looks like it's just the opposite. And uh, maybe we need more understanding uh, of that and a better meaning of the minds. But I read the words, and it's not telling me that. Now, the ANR staff is already engaged in the process you described who want this plan to do. They are already out there looking at what's available and what's out there and uh, finding ways to, finding tools to help this industry uh, and, and, and to accomplish their mission. So I think we're already doing all that. Representative, oh, were you finished? I'm good, yeah. I'm, I'm... Representative Sibelia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Ed, for your testimony. I apologize for coming in late. I have reviewed the materials that you brought in. I just want to make sure that I'm <clears throat> clear on, uh, I think, kind of the, the biggest concern that you have, and that is that permanent conservation would take um, lands that are permanently conserved would not be available for, for, for the forest products industry. Is that Sometimes, not always. I mean, a lot of these easements do allow for management. But, right? but is that the, but is that? There are some easements like the forever wild easements that literally take us out of yeah. the picture. So would you say that, that is, that's your largest concern? I just wanna make sure that I'm hearing correctly. And what I think I'm hearing you say is that you are worried that if we permanently conserve these lands, there will be less lands available for uh, the forest products industry and, and law. With the, the only caveat is, is it depends on what kind of easement it is. Okay. And so for someone like me, who really is a strong supporter of the forest products industry, as well as wanting to retain, you know, a healthy state for all of us, it's important to me that I understand the nature of the problem that you have so that, you know, if and when we pass this bill out, we can try to make sure that we can address that. So that's why I'm asking my question. So your concern is making sure that permanent conservation does not mean we can't we can't access those lands largely generally if this bill passes yeah and i imagine it will um i'm not fearful that our industry is just going to wither away okay but the direction we're going now okay the priorities i'm seeing coming from the general assembly is not looking at the trajectory we see and it's not, doesn't seem willing to, to address that. You, you have different priorities. And um, we love conservation. We're not afraid of 9% old growth, but we think it's stupid to have only 3% early successional. We do. And I hope that Bob Zane is listening right now and will explain to you why they have a political number for early successional acreage when all these biologists we talk to say we need about 15% early successional habitats in order to maintain a healthy forest over the long term. So we're not arguing the 9%, we're arguing the 3%, okay? And, and the trajectory we see is our forests are getting older and they're getting more crowded. We're only harvesting at half the growth rate. We've been doing that for 40 years now, we're falling way behind. And uh, the priorities we think is misplaced. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. All right, members, we're going to pivot. I think we have David Snedeker, yes, on the Zoom, director of the Northeast Vermont Development Association. Good morning, can you hear me? 
Uh, we can. So. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair Sheldon and uh, committee members. Uh, my name is David Snedeker. I'm the director of the Northeastern Vermont Development Association, and we serve the three rural counties of uh, Northeastern Vermont, Caledonia, Essex, and Orleans as both the Regional Planning and the Regional Economic Development Corporation. So um, I think I have the ability to, um, I also have a, I guess back in the early 2000s, I was also the administrator for what were then the unorganized towns and gores of Essex County. That was um, six municipal entities. And uh, my role was to kind of help adjust after the champion land sales happened there many years ago. So I can speak to that a bit. And I'm gonna try and share my slide screen. Pleasure. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, so there's the greetings and I'll just jump down. So uh, well, thank you for inviting me to, in to speak on uh, H-126. It's obviously a bill that would, would be important to the Northeast Kingdom region, Mick, as you'll I'll kind of demonstrate why. But um, if the legislature decides to move forward uh, with the goals of 30% of Vermont's land by 2030 and 50% by 2050, I would like to offer the following comments for the community's consideration if, if land conservation or additional land conservation is the way we want to move forward. Uh, I would suggest that the regional planning commissions, which were outlined in the bill, be heavily involved in this process because each region of the state has its own regional plan that's adopted by the communities within our respective regions, and they would likely have some information that would inform a, a statewide plan, as would uh, local communities be able to in, in help with that information as well. And our plans usually address things like land use. Uh, or they're required to address land use, natural resources, and other related topics such as transportation, community and economic development, and energy. So we also see a role uh, for regional planning commissions in the review of the three conservation categories that were outlined in section 2801 of this proposed bill. Again, uh, NVDA is a region that serves the three most rural counties in Vermont, and there's a very long history of serving our communities and businesses that very much continue to rely on the working landscape for both community and economic development. And we would certainly have an interest in seeing this continue. And those uses would include hunting, logging, maple production, increasingly recreation. And more recently, we're seeing uh, the, the desire to develop a mass timber industry uh, in Vermont, which would help address the region's housing, short housing shortage. So uh, I think, I totally agree with the earlier remarks of having a managed forest. Uh, I do have a background in parks and recreation management. That was my bachelor's degree from West Virginia University many years ago. Uh, but again, managed forests, I believe, are the healthy forests. And uh, I would say that NVDA and the other regional planning commissions have significant experience in data collection, conducting inventories, and developing um, comprehensive land use plans that could certainly inform a statewide conservation plan, such as the one being proposed. And we're also very experienced at gathering uh, public input at the local level, and believe it's very important for any statewide conservation plan to be informed with significant local input. Um, I did take uh, talk with my GS, GIS staff earlier, and they were able to pull from available statewide data that uh, shows the percentages of uh, land use in Vermont, uh, federally, federally owned lands, 8% statewide, 2% of the federal lands in the Northeast Kingdom. That would mainly be the uh, Silvio Conte National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, state owned lands, the total for the state is 9%. Uh, that would be 16% of state owned lands in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, municipally owned lands in Vermont, 1% statewide, 1% in the Northeast Kingdom. And this would include town forests, some of which are actively managed as well. Um, land trust and other conserved lands in Vermont, the total uh, is about 10% statewide, and that number is 15% in the Northeast Kingdom. Uh, land use or land enrolled in the current use program in Vermont totals 36%, and that would include uh, agricultural land, not just forest land. 
uh, NEK data I didn't have available at the time, but I know it's more heavily weighted toward the forest side. So I'm, I'm guessing the percentage is going to be enrolled or higher than 36% and for forest lands. So looking at the total of the above lands for Vermont, if you want to look at these as lands for possible, possible conservation, we're already at 64% statewide and NEK were over 34%, but again, that did not include the current use lands that are enrolled in forestry in our region. So I would suggest that we may be, as the earlier speaker did, suggest that we may be closer to the goals that we're trying to achieve here. So just something to consider. And I guess the, before I jump to the, my next attachments, I would just say that uh, from my experience with uh, working with the unified or unorganized towns and gores back then, when the champion lands were sold, uh, so U.S. Fish and Wildlife took a large percentage of that land uh, the state of Vermont did for the West Mountain Wildlife Management Area, and then some land was remaining with the Essex Timber Company. But uh, Essex Timber was the only group that was, in my uh, opinion, actively managing the, the land as it should have been. Uh, I would say that uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife lands, the money that was given to the towns for, for the federal government owning that land was based on federal revenue sharing. And it never achieved the, the level that it was supposed to when it was uh, initially uh, sold because the the revenues from the fish and wildlife makes, it's uh, uh, maybe it was dimes on the dollar as to what the towns should have received. And then state pilot payments often lagged behind what um, the actual value would have been. Uh, and both of these have an impact on municipal budgets. So that, that's something to, to consider as well. And I would add that um, the conservation conservation initiatives from groups like the Vermont Land Trust, uh, the Nature Conservancy, and the Conservation Fund often uh, seek local and regional support before they move forward. Uh, they, these were almost always voluntary initiatives, and I think conservation should be voluntary and not uh, mandated by the state or the federal government. So that's my comment there. Thank you for your testimony. I, I do have one more uh, attachment. I just wanted to show a little bit about what regional plans look like and, and how they could probably be helpful to a conservation plan. All right. So each, each regional plan would have an analysis of different types of land use. Here I just put the forest land uh, for an example. But we'd be using available data resources that are available statewide, the same as done for, for, for agriculture or natural resources and developed lands as well. So there's usually a data collection and analysis phase. And we do uh, often recognize, or we do have an awareness of regional land use issues. And in our region, there was a period where we were looking at the loss of forest cover, uh, probably more toward the developed areas of our region. And then we do, um, this is to help our communities, we do identify preservation tools. Oh, um, excuse me, David, um, are you, we're, we're seeing the same memo. Were you gonna walk us through your other document? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I'll, let me close that. <laughs> I usually have my staff do, <laughs> do the screen sharing stuff. Okay, we're there? Not yet. We have you. Which is, we also have access to your submission online. So Oops. we could, if you want, okay. we, do have, we do have it up on our devices or we can. Okay, if that's okay, if that's okay I'll just speak to that. So in, in, uh, from the experts from the regional plan, I did talk about the forest land and we're, we talked about the awareness of the issues and um, with the data collection and analysis phase, but we also have uh, maps that uh, talk about the different land use. So I, I included a, a, an attachment that shows the public lands already in uh, Vermont, publicly owned lands already in Vermont for our region. And then um, on the next slide, it talked about current land use, and this is not current use, this is land use as our plan was written in 2018, which we are in the process of updating. But as you can see, it's a dark green map, and the dark green shows that much of our region is 
uh, forest lands, with, with the exception of quite a bit of agricultural land in Orleans County. Uh, the next map would show uh, natural resource constraints. So we are, are aware of known development constraints that should factor into conservation decisions. Uh, ground truthing is always important as well, but the resource restriction sh shows areas above 2,000 feet, uh, slopes above 20% in grade, uh, threatened or endangered wildlife species habitats, and uh, deer wintering areas, and et cetera. So those should, uh, are all important. And in our regional plan, we did identify habitat, habitat connectors, which closely align with the, what the forested lands are in, in our area as well. And a lot of those lands are still used for hunting and uh, timber management today. And then the habitat blocks, very similar to the habitat connectors. Uh, and, and you'll note that some of these blocks vary in the value of their uh, habit importance as, as far as habitat. So another thing to consider. And again, all this is just to show that um, the regional planning commissions are well positioned to help with any kind of development of a statewide plan if that's the way we go. And then the very last map I have uh, shows the conserved lands. And again, this was as of 2018. Uh, many areas have already been conserved in our region, as you can tell by the map. Uh, and it would be important to evaluate the allowed uses and restrictions on those easements and limitations that are already in place. So. That's essentially all I have for my presentation. Thank you, that was very helpful. Um, I encourage members to check out that second handout of the excerpts from that uh, regional, regional plan. Do members have questions? Representative Sebelia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thanks, Dave, uh, for your testimony. I have five questions, four of them are really quick. Uh, First of all, how many towns does the NVDA uh, represent? Uh, it's 55 municipalities and there's 50 legislative bodies. So we're the biggest region by far. And how many staff do you have? Uh, we have uh, 11. So, and th three of those are admin staff, the rest are planners. Great. Thank you. Uh, in on table 1.1 .1 of your second document, um, this was really, Great. Table 1.1. 1 .1. Uh, can you just explain to me the definitions of the column titles? What they mean? Oh, okay. I see. Start, starting and, for, forest yeah. land. Yeah. Oh, this was all re related to the uh, Vermont wood fuel supply study. And I guess I'm not going to be able to speak to that 100% uh, accurately, but. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. And uh, I, will get a, I will get an answer for you that on that. That would be really helpful. Thank you, Dave. Uh, how can we know uh, the the uh, number? How much uh, land is in current use in the kingdom? So I was surprised to see that that was not something that was known. How could we know that? Oh, uh, we can track it down. I think we our GIS staff. I kind of gave them this assignment on very short notice. Excellent. And now we have the statewide numbers, but we do have it at a regional level. So I can also get that as well. And I can even get the breakdown between forest land and agricultural. That would, I would really appreciate that. I'm sure the committee would. Um, and then my last question is around VHCB. So we've heard from them uh, and that they're doing a tremendous amount of work in this area. Can you just describe how the regional commissions are interacting with VHCB uh, in that work, and if that's consistent throughout the state uh, to the to the effect that you're aware. Um, I'm not sh uh, sure exactly what yeah. specific work VHCB is doing right now. We've not really been interacting with them on any kind of a conservation uh, initiative at this point. Okay. We do work with them on housing and, and land conservation, and they do reach out when they are seeking support from both the locality and the or municipality and the region, so. We haven't started reaching out yet. Okay, great. That's it, thank you, Madam Chair. The, the other group we do work with is the Northern Forest Center, and that's uh, an organization that works across the uh, northern tiers of four states, so Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, New York, and it's about you know, actively working uh, with our forest landowners and, and for both economic development, community development, and uh, at, at times, conservation, so. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. 
right, members, I think we'll take a, we'll come back at seven minute break. We'll come back at five past the hour. We are continuing to take testimony on H126 and we're gonna welcome Deb Brighton, who's a consultant with the Joint Fiscal Office to answer our questions on potential tax implications of conserve, conserving land. Welcome. <clears throat> Are you ready? We're ready. <laughs> um, so I'm Deb Brighton, and I'm leaving the Joint Fiscal Office, handing over my tax work to someone else. Um, but this part I hadn't, um, I'd sort of forgotten about, so um, I'm here. <laughs> okay, and I'm trying to answer the questions from Representative Sibelia about the effect of land conservation on municipal tax rules and on um, municipal taxes. And I think um, that there, it depends on the type of conservation that you, you do. So basically I was gonna run through the different types of conservation and the provisions that each one has separately and then look at where we are now. Um, and um, question, Representative Sibili asked about municipal and not school taxes. And that's appropriate because now um, if land is taken off the tax rolls or if you change the grant list or whatever, it doesn't affect the host town's school tax, which is now based on the spending per pupil. And it does mean that less money goes into the ed fund. So the state as a whole is affected on their school tax rates. Okay, but so we're gonna focus just on the municipal. And that's normally about less than a third of the total tax rate. Okay. I will just say you've just piqued my interest on that non-residential. So okay. Cumulative. <laughs> it's another contract. discussion almost, yes. is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so basically what happens when land is conserved, um, some value is removed from the municipal grant list. And when value is removed from the grant list, assuming the budget stays the same, the municipal tax rate would have to go up to cover that. Um, unless there's also other revenue that comes in because of that um, conservation purchase or acquisition. And so that's where it sort of uh, differs in what type of conservation that we do. So I wanted to start with federal land. And federal land um, isn't taxed at the, by the municipality. And so land that's owned in fee simple by the, here it's mostly the uh, Green Mountain National Forest, the Forest Service, but it could also be the National Park Service, um, Army Corps of Engineers. So it's totally exempt. It has to be removed from the municipal grant list, but they make a payment and um, it's called the payment tilt. Um, not to be confused with the state payment, which is pilot, but they both stand for payment in lieu of taxes. And the PILT is a straight per acre. It doesn't matter the value of the land um, same across the whole U.S. It goes up with inflation every year. It's, uh, this year it's $2.94 an acre. Um, in some cases, that towns do better with that. Um, in most cases, they don't. It's less than they would have gotten uh, with their municipal tax rate. But it varies from town to town, depending on what their tax rate is now, whether that's that raises or lowers their municipal tax rate. Um, there's also a federal payment that goes to school districts. And I'm not gonna discuss that now, but uh, just so, just so that you know that the federal government does make two payments um, on their land. State land, um, state land owned by the Agency of Natural Resources makes a payment of taxes also, but it's called pilot. And this has changed, um, well, it's changed a lot over say 30 or 40 years. Um, when we started out, making this payment, uh, an, a state acquisition of land would make the town lose both the school taxes and the municipal taxes. So it was substantial. So we were paying 1% of the value um, 
of the land to the municipality. And then after Act 60, we took away that school portion um, of the tax loss. And so pilot went down um, to a lower percentage, uh, but towns complained because they didn't exactly understand what was going on. So then it was moved back up again. Yeah, but they also allowed land to go in either its regular value, its fair market value, or its use value. And there was some land at use value and some land at fair market value, and it was sort of, it didn't seem right. So in 2016, we took another look at it and set up another system for pilot. And so all of the land was valued, all of the state land was valued in 2016. And then that land pay, pilot payment is about that value times 60 cents, basically a tax rate of 60 cents. Um, so it would be for a municipality that has a municipal rate lower than that, it would be a good deal. For a municipality with a higher rate, it's less. Um, and the 60 cents was chosen to be about in the middle of the municipal tax rates at that time. And then if land is acquired after that point, um, it is the payment is the value at the time that is acquired times the town's municipal tax rate. And so that payment is frozen and it's just all the, um, the agency reviews every five years um, reviews the payments and make, ask for an adjustment. And they just made ask for their first adjustment last year. Um, the adjustment says that they should consider, in order to make the adjustment, they should look at um, municipal tax rates and other data. And the last time they only looked at municipal tax rates. And so they municipal tax rates were going up slightly. So they increased the payment slightly. Um, that won't make sense in an inflationary period like we're in now, because if you think about it, if our land values went up 10% and our budgets went up, say, 3%, we could actually lower the tax, the municipal tax rate and bring in the same amount of money. So if we find that we're lowering the municipal tax rates and we adjust our, a, our pilot payment by that, it would go down in the time when we needed to go up. Um, so it's there, um, but there's, we, I think something needs to be changed before at the next five year look at the adjustment. Um, but I think the intention is uh, to make it fairly close to an average municipal um, tax burden. Um, and let's see, the, uh, if land, the next would be um, land owned by a qualified conservation organization in fee simple. And there isn't very much of that. Um, in general, land conservation organizations um, are dealing with easements. So there are, let's see, um, only 38,000 acres owned in fee by land conservation organizations that are allowed to put it into the current use program. So they, it's appraised at its value as conservation land um, and it's taxed, but the conservation organization can enroll it in the current use program so that it's, um, it pays taxes at the same as a private parcel would in current use. Um, so the bulk of the, cons uh, the property that's conserved by an easement um, comes under uh, Title 10. Um, actually, I should point out that I have um, I've attached a document that has the sort of the sites so that you can find out more about any of these. Um, but it's it's Title 10, Chapter 155 that talks about um, land subject to conservation easements, and it says that the the rights that the state or the rights of the state or a qualified organization 
um, own, which would be the easement itself, are exempt from taxation. And that the underlying rights that the owner holds, um, so that's the parcel subject to the easement, um, is taxed based only on those remaining rights. So it's clear um, that something's been removed from the parcel and that the value that goes on the grand list is only the remaining rights. But the question then is, well, how do you value those remaining rights? How much has been lost? And this is where there's really no answer, <laughs> no good answer. Um, if the land, the land, highest and best use of the land had been say timberland and the easement and most easements allow timber management to continue, there's really no change in value. People may feel there's just a change in value that you have that, that option removed that you had before. And so they may change the value, but in some cases they don't because it was already, already appraised as if it was timberland and would always be timberland. Um, in other cases, um, particularly if there's a house and um, say, I don't know, 75 acres and there's a house with it, um, people may feel that the highest and best use of that property is as an estate. And um, so in that case, they wouldn't lower it. I've never seen it increased and I can't see the, any logic for increasing the value. However, I've been at um, conferences with the Lincoln Institute where they were dealing with this and sort of in the early days with a lot of municipal officials who were raising the value of land subject to easements. And partly I think they felt, well, if people can put an easement on their land, then they can afford it. <laughs> I don't know what the logic is. I, I don't think we do that. I would say we do not um, increase values when you put an easement on it. But I have seen situations where I have been out with an appraiser on land where they had already done um, septic surveys for three lots. And the appraiser said, uh, this is along Lake Champlain, the appraiser said, no, the highest and best use of this, you would get the most money as one lot for one house. Yes. So, so we have a, we do have a, a question from Representative Sevilla. Just around uh, making sure that I understand who is making this determination about the value and it's the municipal officials, assessors that are making that. Yes. Yeah, just confirming yes, that for myself. Just who are uh, making a determination about the value of the remaining rights. Um, in the case of uh, <clears throat> of the ANR land, that was valued by the state. Okay. Yeah. Um, and property valuation has uh, it, but in your little handout. The is going off. Well, uh, property valuation put together a booklet on how to appraise land subject to easements. Sorry, we Sorry. got distracted. If you wouldn't mind saying that again, we had a phone ringing that was quite lovely, but distracting. We can hear the kitchen in other words. I see. <laughs> I apologize. Hear it. I, I, I don't know how it started. It was in my pocket. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue for towns. They don't quite know how to go about it. And property valuation has put together this document that is on your um website uh, to help them figure out how to do it. And there's also a section in the listener's handbook, but essentially it says there are these different things that you should consider, but essentially you have to look at the highest and best use. <laughs> um, and so there's nothing, people kept wanting there to be something like, it's a decrease of 20%, but it just doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It's just the same way as replacing a parcel of land. It's, you have to consider all the context and all the pieces. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, the bottom line is that most acquisitions of, of conservation land or rights in land remove value from the grant list. And if nothing else changes, that would mean the municipal rate would go up. But in some cases, there are these other payments that come in um, that offset that so that the municipal rate may not actually go up. 
And in a, a lot of cases, the value on the surrounding parcels goes up um, because, you know, they're, it's, they have, it's protection to them and they don't have to buy it, you know, so they're, that, that, that value goes up. So that may offset some of the loss as well. And that would be more likely in areas where there's um, more development potential. Um, so uh, what I wanted to show you um, is sort of where we are now in terms of the conservation land and um, and taxes. Let's see if I can. Get this top part out of the way and do this. Well, is that a PowerPoint? Yeah, but it's got some, something's blocked my. You go down in the lower right, maybe that you could do a slideshow. Well, at least you can see the map. Um, this this is based on um, Jens Hilke. Um, did this just last week, and I'm sure you know him. Yes, he's been in here before. He's great. Um, so he took the all the conserved conserve land in, from the GIS and, um, and made this map so that you can see the, um, where the towns are, where, where it is within the town boundaries. And so he also created a file that for me that had the acreage in each town that has been conserved. And this is in all any way that it's conserved. Um, and it ends up being slightly more, I know you've heard a lot of numbers about how much is conserved. He said he came in last year and said that there was 22 plus or minus um, percent of the land that is currently um, conserved. This shows more like 26%. And <clears throat> he thinks the difference is, well, there may have been more land added and, and mapped. Um, but also part of the difference is this shows municipal land, which may, it could be turned into a landfill. You know, it's not necessarily conserved. Um, Wait, go ahead. Yeah. Yes, so just clarifying actually, <laughs> this is part of my consternation with this bill right now is, is just understanding what we mean. So <laughs> this is conserved land, which is not necessarily permanently conserved land. It includes current use? No, no. It doesn't. Current oh, use land is not considered. So this is just permanently conserved land? Permanently conserved, um, in, including municipal land um, that's owned by the, by the public, but not necessarily subject to conservation easement. So the municipal land could be used for something else. Yeah. Okay, that went in that side, thank you. Okay, um, and this is just the yeah, same. Just to clarify that. Yeah. Um, you're really talking about the difference between the 22% that is actually currently conserved for instance, and this 26% is current. So that's where that municipal land might fall, yeah. right? Within that. In that 4%, 4%. yeah. Yeah, okay. And okay. they're also, this is, um, even doing this map, there were they found issues of like overlapping polygons and um, some parcels that go across state lines. Um, some, there was an issue with land dial and the land between the, the lake essentially being. But anyway, so that so it's we're not totally one hundred percent there yet. Um, but I just wanted to show you the basis for the numbers that I'm going to use later. Okay. And this is just where he's uh, colored in the town to give you an idea of where the towns are, the darker towns, where they have the highest percentages, probably have already met their 30%. Well, yeah, I, go ahead. Just about the men. Could you just, do you know which one of those is Montpelier? Which one? Which one of those <laughs> towns is Montpelier? Just to orient me to them. Uh, do you have a good spatial sense? Which one's more? Yeah. 
Which one? I, can, I can only tell Somebody, you. Somebody in this room. Nobody can tell me. It's what I mean. Multi small. 2.4 yeah. <coughs> ish. We can get you yeah, that map, Representative Tori. Okay. Sorry, it, sorry, I thought if it was on top of anyone's mind, they could. Just... Over here, so... Okay, so what I did was I took his numbers of acres in every town and looked at the municipal tax rates. And lined all the towns up um, by their conserved acres mm -hmm. and then um, took the median municipal rate in each of those, uh, divided them into five groups, into quintiles. So there are 49 in all of the groups. I dropped the unorganized towns and gores because those have a lot of conserved land and really low rates. It would skew everything. So I have 49 in each of my quintiles, okay? And so what it's showing you is that, um, here, it's going this way. You have the um, number of acres that are conserved is the least here and it's the most here. So in other words, as you have more and more conserved land, it tends to drop the municipal, you tend to have lower municipal, effective tax rates. And these are the municipal rates, all adjusted by the CLAs and are all brought up to fair market value so they can be compared. Okay. And then the other way of looking at the taxes is to look at the tax bill on, a, on the average value house. And you see the same pattern over here, which is that the towns that have, that have the most conserved land have the lowest tax bills on the average value house. Um, Representative Sibelia. The other thing that we looked at was the um, percentage of land, because you may have a very small, you know, small acreage and, you know, 100% conserved or whatever, but you see that it's the same pattern for both of those. Representative um, Sibelia has a question. This is really helpful, and I don't know if you can answer this now, and maybe just a pin for follow up. So, when we look at you know uh, higher percentages of conserved, it does seem to be um, along uh, areas where there are a lot of ski areas uh, or second homes, and so I wonder about that skewing the municipal rate because you've got okay, so so much such a higher grand list to start from. Okay, I, yeah, I mean, these are the things I, I would love to check into. Yeah. So if that's a good one um, to see how, because yeah. It's coming, coming from those areas where there are a tremendous amount of second homes, you know, so you have a much larger tax base. And so, you know, is that, and you also have a lot more conservation. So, you know, yeah. it, I don't know if conservation is causing the decreased tax rate or just a much larger grand list. Yeah. So, well, all right. Interesting. <laughs> I wanted, this is really, really helpful. Okay. Just in terms of framing. So thank you. So that, what I wanted to do was just show you what is. Yes. Um, and because that was, that is sort of your starting point for where we are now and it gives you some idea of where we're going in the future. But this absolutely doesn't tell you that conservation is the key to lowering your taxes. Mm -hmm. um, because... Well, I'll show you the next slide and then. All right, this is the opposite. This is population. Okay, so this is the same idea. All the towns put them into quintiles. So you've got like 50, 49 towns in each group and we've got the population. And as the population goes up, the municipal tax rate goes up. Okay, and same with the tax bill. As the population goes up, the tax bill goes up. And this is even more steep, I would say, because as the population goes up, the house values go up too. So you've got sort of the double effect of that. And, and that would be attributed to a, an increased demand in services and need for police and whatever the municipality's taken on. Exactly. The reason that we raise taxes is to provide services for people. And so it's 
it's not to say that the towns with the highest taxes are losers. They may have the best community. I mean, they they have things that the other communities don't. Um, so, so anyway, I'm, and it doesn't mean that if you want to solve your tax problems, you should just conserve your land. Um, you know, it's, it's really, you've got to find that balance. But I think that, um, and I know I'm, I'm just telling you what is and what you really want to know is what will be. And that's where I, you know, isn't going to tell us that exactly, but it will give us a starting point. And I think that sometimes a lot of, there are a lot of misconceptions about what makes your tax bill go up or down, or sometimes people only look at the first thing, something goes off or comes on the tax rolls, but they don't look at the budget changes, you know, so that they don't, you know, put the pieces together to, to truly understand what's going to happen with a decision. Thank you so much for this. This was great. I would also ask, I have a question, which is um, frequently, I feel like when we have JFO in, we talk a lot about costs. We don't um, account for benefits very well. Yeah. And um, personally, you just, you said one, people like to live near conserved land. <laughs> Why is that? Because it's an amenity that people really enjoy for a lot of reasons, different people for different reasons. Um, and there's a benefit to that community of that open, available public land too. And so how is it that we could start to account for those benefits in dollars as opposed to always just the costs? Huh. I'm gonna let Deb answer that question. <laughs> and then if, uh, add something that I would welcome it, Representative Stebbins. Um, you know, I think one other point also is that um, sometimes we look at conservation as um, precluding something that would increase your tax base, you know. Um, so it's sort of, it's locking it up and, and we could have something that would bring in more taxes um, and would also cost more, but we generally talk of, just look at like the first step. Um, but I think that in a lot of cases, uh, conserving one piece of land doesn't really preclude that development in your town. It goes someplace else. And that may be part of the planning process here is that you are precluding the development where you want it and helping to direct it someplace else. But I don't really think that it's usually a sort of like development won't happen because you've conserved that piece of land. I think it just moves someplace else. You have any thoughts on my benefits calculation for JFO? <laughs> um, no, <laughs> I know that you um, has Kate Monner been in and, and talked about the study. Um, I think she was going to come in, but anyway, they did sort of a return on investment, but they looked at more of the um, ecosystem benefits. She's with Trust for Public Land. Excuse me? She's with Trust for Public Land. Yeah. Right. I just, some yes. people might not know that. Yes. Yep. Um, so they did a, a report on that. Um, and maybe Peter will follow up on <laughs> sort of the, what makes the, what makes the best communities. Yeah. Well, thank you for the work you've done. Are there further questions? Great, thank okay, you. Okay, I'll check the second homes to see if I can figure anything out there. But if you have any other what ideas. I missed the second home point that you made. Yeah, so if you look on the map, yeah. Uh, yeah. If, no. you, if we look at uh, the conserved. You know, I got your, yeah, your point. A lot of the conserved land is where there might be more second homes. Yes, but and so when you have more second homes, uh, you have much, that's a much larger grand list. Yeah. So the cost of providing services in that town is much less for the residents, uh, oftentimes. So I live in a town which is one fifth residents, four fifths, second homes. And, you know, that allows us to provide a lot of services at a much lower rate than, you know, a town, uh, you know, to the east of me that does not have that kind of second home tax base. So, and, and also those towns pay for, uh, education throughout the state, uh, which is another, but 
my, my question was, if I think not question, my yes, my question was, when we looked at one of the charts that Deb had shown was that um, conserved was uh, resulting in a lower rate. But when I look at conserved, it's in a lot of areas where I think where there are a lot of second home, where there are much more valuable grant lists already because there's a lot of development. And so I don't know if conserved equals lower taxes or conserved is happening in places where there's a lot of second homes, maybe. Or so, what that relationship might be. I would say it's both. Um, I did run the. Oh, I should say one thing that all of those charts that I showed you with the the lines. The, I ran the statistics on the correlations first, and they're all significant at the zero one level. Um, another one that's significant is the size of the municipal equalized grant list, and so it tends to be lower. Where there's more conservation, but mixed in there are the high ones. What tends to be lower? The municipal grand list. Tends to be lower where there's more. Towns with more conserved land. That's, yep. I, that's a list. There's a, I would love to see. That. Okay, that, I'll do that because there it's an odd combination. Yeah, it would just be, I mean, I'm just. There's okay. Your that. point is probably well taken, Representative Sibili, but there's not yeah. that many towns that are like yours. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but I was going back to the point at the beginning where you said that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> and I missed what the that was um, in the introduction of your presentation. You said I didn't look at this because that's a whole nother. Wait, say that again. I missed it. Uh, okay. Never mind. I, I missed it. It's okay. Well, this was a great presentation. <laughs> and you noted it at the, at the beginning. That's the, no. thing, the thing that you're <laughs> the thing that the thing that, uh, that I missed. It's not that I can't remember it. Yeah. I was distracted, and you said, "Oh yeah, that's a whole other conversation." Yes, and I was curious what the whole other conversation it, was oh, that we are not having. Yes, second. Oh, the other at the beginning was. Thank you. It, what it was? Non, non, it was non homestead. Oh, okay. I thought it was this effect on the statewide on the school. Tax yes, non homestead school yeah. tax rate. Yes. Okay. Yes. What is the cost? to the ed fund yes and then mm -hmm. on the non-res side so what i heard you say is it does not cost the residents which is great but it is costing businesses and second homeowners and so do we know what the cost is on the non side? Um, on, on the education side yeah. or on the municipal side education side education Good. no it, it costs both rates go up at the same time the way we set the education tax rate education tax. is we figure out how, how much we need to raise from property taxes. And then if we need more, because all this land's been taken off the tax rolls, we increase both the non-residential and the homestead rates proportionately. And so what I think what I heard you say was that the residential were making whole in our tax, pot, like current use and other things. You did not say that. So we are having an effect on the statewide property yes. tax. So that number would be yeah. cumulative. So we, take, both. we take land off the tax rolls um, for conservation purposes. Yeah. Um, it doesn't pay school taxes. Yeah. Okay. So that amount has to be made up. Um, and so it's made up by raising the property tax rates. Okay. I must for school. I misheard you at the I'm sorry. your presentation and I thought you said there's no effect on the residential. I know what you. I know why you're saying what you're saying. What I think, <laughs> what's going on, is that you've <laughs> been given municipality where there's conservation. There's not a direct correlation on the school tax side because it's spread statewide. Yeah. Um, and it's not that it's not that um, it doesn't have some impact, but you could say it has very little impact on the community in question because it gets spread against such a large base. That's correct. So you heard doesn't have an effect. And I understand why that happened. Uh, yeah. I can't remember what you said. So there's a on the on the municipal tax side, municipal side, it's direct. Yeah. But um, on this on the education side, it's it's indirect or it's spread over a much, much larger base. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Yeah. So it's the host town that gets just the municipal effect. Yeah. And then the whole state deals with the rest. Yep. Yeah. Representative Smith. Thank you. Uh, talking about pilot tax, pilot payments. Uh, if a town receives a pilot payment, 
does that pilot payment is there a portion of it that goes to the education funding as like like property taxes or does that go into a town's general fund town it does yes and same with the the federal money goes to the town um and the a and the a and r money yep both go to the town representative Tory. thank you Hi. We used to have to go to the school district too but not anymore wonderful thank you the, the federal payment that goes to the school district is called the 25 percent fund and it comes differently separately okay, good. from the treasurer's office here to the school district so you don't get it out of the town good thank you um and one other thing i wanted to point out is that the, the, that pilot payment um is ours something that the legislature created so if it something you can change you know so it's if one of the things that you look at when you go through this process is sometimes being overburdened or whatever um that's your ability to deal with it and representative tory oh yes thank you i just had a question about um analysis you can do around that ed fund impact like it seems like that would be a murky thing to be able to track is it is it something that you could ferret out how how that's changed as conservation has increased in the state but that kind of impact is something that could be visible or not like, you know in terms of statistics um we'd have to figure out how to value the amount that's lost right um we could do something sort of back of the envelope if um you know just by the number of acres and then yeah i'm just the compared to what part is the hard part for me to get my head around but yeah but i'm sure yeah. you, you can get okay let me, let me think about that one yeah just curious about what would go into it okay Representative Sibelia. Yes. Uh, pilot, just remind me the source of funds for that program. The source of funds for? Pilot payments. So I know local option. The, the source, like for the pilot payment? For the pilot program, like um, where the funds come from for that. It just goes in the budget. It's, um, there's no special. Must be a source. I think it's. Well, okay. So, the, so I local option tax. I know there's a portion of that that's retained by the state and does not actually. Oh, correct. Goes for pilot, but I'm wondering. If I think that goes for pilot on state buildings, and um, this is this is in the same chapter, pilot on land, um, but the the um, that special fund that was set up with the part of the local option tax goes to the state building part. Interesting. So they're two. They're they have the same name, I guess, but they're two separate payments. And so, for example, the um, pilot payment for buildings was prorated, um, and the pilot payment for ANR land was not. It was a separate line in the budget. Thank you for your presentation. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right, committee. Next up, we have Lauren Oates. With two accountants for parents, that was like a bit of childhood trauma. That was great. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, maybe. No, morning still. Uh, for the record, I'm Lauren Oates. I'm the Director of Government Relations and Policy with the Nature Conservancy in Vermont. Um, just a bit of background on TNC here. Uh, the Nature Conservancy in Vermont has helped conserve more than 300,000 acres in Vermont. Uh, currently owns and manages a little bit more than 25,000 acres. And 23% of all Vermont publicly owned lands were originally acquired by and then transferred uh, to the state by TNC. Conservation is quite literally in our name. Uh, and as an international organization focused on conserving and restoring our natural resources for all people, uh, TNC Vermont is excited to support the goals of H126 for the opportunity to testify today. 
As we consider our changing climate alongside the developmental need, needs and pressures in the decade ahead that you've heard a lot about on this bill, both last session and this, um, planning for biodiversity protection is an essential part of our survivability uh, equation and has deeply rooted concerns regarding our equity. A couple of points to make there. Uh, ecosystem conver conversion and resultant biodiversity collapse is a leading cause of pandemics. Biodiversity loss threatens food security, which is already a pressing need in Vermont. Loss of biodiversity and species abundance threatens our economic prosperity. Land conversion that reduces biodiversity also threatens our climate resilience collectively for our communities. Um, and the, the list of ramifications goes on and on, but those are just a couple of highlights I wanted to make. And yet we know with climate change and biodiversity loss, um, that are currently happening. Uh, there are a couple of statistics that I wanna share as well for Vermont. First, globally, we've seen a decline in 68% of our vertebrate populations in the last 50 years. The rate of species extinction is at least tens to hundreds of times greater than average over the past 10 million years. So we're seeing a significant increase in biodiversity loss and abundance loss. In Vermont alone, we've seen a 14% abundance loss in our forested bird species. Uh, the picture is even more dire when we look at our freshwater populations. Our freshwater vertebrate populations have declined 84% since 1970, which is twice the rate of terrestrial and marine biome loss. Our species are moving northward 11 miles and 36 feet upslope each decade. So there is a significant move in elevation as well as latitude to continue to follow climates that will support current habitats. And we also know from the 2021 Vermont Climate Assessment uh, that Vermont is getting warmer to the tune of about two degrees Fahrenheit and wetter about 7.5 inches, uh, which has major implications on our landscape, our communities, our collective public health and our economic sectors. Recognizing these current impacts and worsening models, I just wanted to point out uh, rather time sensitively that the COP15 just held a biodiversity conference in Montreal. Um, that was in December to address the growing crisis, crisis of biodiversity collapse, where the 188 participating governments to include the United States adopted a global biodiversity framework, which includes a 30% conservation target for 2030. Similarly, H126 offers Vermont the opportunity to develop a thoughtful statewide conservation plan centered on both biodiversity and human community resilience. Connectivity of habitat is essential to supporting our biodiversity, true for both terrestrial and aquatic species. Earlier this week, John Austin with Vermont Fish and Wildlife came in and talked a little bit about Vermont conservation design. I hope that you'll be hearing from Bob Zeno too, who has um, profound information and, and science to share with you all on that. But um, John Austin did mention also the resilient and connected landscape science with the Nature Conservancy. Our Dr. Mark Anderson, uh, coupled with a great deal of scientists in the Eastern region worked on developing this and found that Vermont actually holds a keystone geography to connecting the Southern Appalachian area to uh, internationally up to Quebec. And without that piece, that species migration that I talked about earlier is kind of cut off in the center. Um, let's see. That science was created um, one as a regional corridor uh, and two with climate change and climate models in mind. So really identifying those spaces that we know are most climate resilient and the most climate vulnerable. Uh, finally, it recognizes that although 50%, 57% of Vermont falls within this critical resilient and connected corridor, only 28% of the network has been conserved and we're using USGS gaps one through three to identify that conserved land. I know there's been a lot of conversation of what we'll consider conserved and what we will not. And I'll talk about a bit about that later. Can you just repeat that last bit? Yes. 57% of the Nature Conservancy's resi resilient and connected network identified lands in Vermont. Only 28% of that network has been conserved here. 
And there's a high level of overlap between the Vermont Conservation Design and TNC's Resilient Connected Network. Yes, so, eight has been concerned. Yes, using GAPS one mm -hmm. USGS GAPS one three three as mm -hmm. how we identify conserved. Which which lines up with our definitions of the bill? Yes, yes. Yeah. And using that, there are, I know that numbers have been floating. Our estimate at TNC is that the current number of conserved percentage of conserved is at twenty three to twenty four, which I think mirrors. Um, I think I think the previous testimony giver said Jens Hilke yeah. said twenty two ish. Twenty six. So I, I want to just rewind since we've we've interrupted you. Um, you said at COP15 in Montreal, they adopted 30, 30 by 30 as a goal internationally. Yep. Um, so is that number based in science? It is based in science. It's been a global priority uh, or framework rather for the last couple of decades. And I think that we're getting more and more governments to sign on. Uh, obviously, some places need to conserve more than that. Some already have a lot of conserved lands, but as a global framework, 30% has been identified by scientists as a critical need to meet both climate mitigation goals and climate adaptation goals in this decade. Thank you. Representative Smith. I've got kind of an odd question, which might surprise everybody. But, uh, the warmest January on record was in 1906. Would that have been... Uh, global warming back in 1906? The way that I've heard um, climate scientists describe the difference between climate and weather is that uh, weather is kind of your mood and climate is your personality. Your moods can change regularly. Your personality takes longer to develop over time. So while we might see um, somewhat aberrant temperatures like over a century ago, the trend is still significantly warming uh, at an increasing rate. So not only increasing uh, temperatures, but also increasing rate of increase. Yeah. yeah, good. <laughs> Personality, that's an analogy. analogy. It is. Um, where was I? Uh, all right. In addition to the need to identify and conserve our terrestrial resources, uh, some of you all who were in this community last year know that I was kind of really harping on aquatic and water-based mm -hmm. conservation. So I'm going to do just a little bit of that again today, uh, I want to commend H-126 for acknowledging the need for a comprehensive statewide conservation plan to truly consider the importance of what conservation of our aquatic systems could and should look like. Importantly, as mentioned before, our freshwater biodiversity loss vastly outweighs that in terrestrial and marine biomes with one in three species threatened with extinction today. This is especially critical in Vermont, where 75% of all of our assessed river miles are detached or disconnected from their floodplains. Um, that's indicating a level of de degradation that is exacerbated uh, by freshwater biodiversity loss and climate change. And it also significantly increases our community vulnerability to flooding. So it's a dual-edged dual -edged sword. Um, and finally, explicit conservation of freshwater systems is imperative. Uh, the Nature Conservancy is grateful for its inclusion in H-126. Investing in strategic conservation to increase the pace of permanent conservation towards a 30 by 30 goal is one of the key recommendations of the Vermont Climate Action Plan. Um, and doing so will not only support biodiversity, which I mentioned before is essential to human survivability, but will also have measurable human and related <laughs> benefits. Of note, improved flood resilience through headwater storage and connected floodplains. Increased carbon sequestration and storage that is necessary to meet our carbon reduction requirements in the Global Warming Solutions Act. Increased access to outdoors and natural spaces for all Vermonters. Increased revenue in outdoor recreation sectors. And the previous testimony we talked you asked a bit, Chair, about the benefits and the Trust for Public Land Study was noted. I know that you've heard that from Charlie Hancock and a couple of others, but I did want to really put a fine point on that. There is a nine to one return on investment for towns, for the state, and for every dollar they spend in conservation, they receive nine back. Um, that's really a really, really significant return on investment that I don't want to be lost uh, in the cost conversation. Um, also improved air and water quality, aiding in our collective public health, health and support for our natural and working lands economy, which is the spine of the state. The decade ahead of us is critical 
to meeting the existential states of our dual crises of climate change and biodiversity loss uh, through higher ambitions for the protection, management, and restoration of nature. Getting here is going to require robust support and investment in land and water conservation. It's going to require philanthropic and public funding. It's going to require us identifying new sources and innovative financing mechanisms, uh, leveraging incentives, as well as implementing strategic policies all of which should be considered during a statewide conservation planning process that's outlined in H-126. It's also essential that we collectively work towards these targets, that we are not solely focused on the how much, but the where. We must consider the essential factor of connectivity focused on a patch corridor network approach and prioritizing investment in those areas. Ensuring that investments in conservation are statewide to improve equitable access to nature and outdoor recreation. And then aquatic systems conservation, essential to biodiversity, water quality, and recreation. Um, a statewide conservation plan targeting 30% conservation by 2030 must include explicit support of these critical systems too. We'll need to be clear about a collective definition of conservation. I know that this committee has heard a lot from different folks and there's the question that's kind of outstanding. What will we consider conservation? What does count for permanent? Uh, what is more ephemeral? Um, acknowledging these different categories, which increase wildlands and old growth forests alongside those that are allowed for sustainable management practices that support our natural and working lands while also having real measurable biodiversity gains. H-126 recognizes the need for these thoughtful conversations to be had in the development of a conservation plan with a list of key partners ranging from indigenous groups to private landowners to the regional planning commissions and beyond. Uh, that diverse engagement and planning is essential to providing a critical plan that prioritizes both biodiversity and community resilience. That we can identify those areas that we know that we need to be protecting and conserving for both nature and people, while also identifying those areas that are suitable for human growth and development. To that end, last week, Trey Martin testified on the work that the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board is doing alongside several agency and conservation partners uh, that they've been working to advance around the statewide conservation planning process. Uh, the Nature Conservancy has been involved in those conversations, um, and we are supportive of modifying the bill to recognize the role and resources that VHCB is offering to assist with the, implement, with the implementation of these bill's goals, this bill's goals. Uh, to close, creating clear targets for meeting 30% conserved lands and waters by 2030 initiative is going to take the collective efforts of the members of this body, federal and state, local and regional governments, the NGO community, state and regional planners, private landowners and managers and beyond. The Nature Conservancy is supportive, exceptionally supportive of supporting a 30% of our lands and waters by 2030 approach and thus is happy to support H-126. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you for allowing me to provide testimony today. Thank you for your testimony. Will you be able to provide us that written testimony? Yes, I will. There's a lot. I finished it last night. I started. With a sick baby and two hours of sleep. <laughs> so yes, it's coming, but there are typos. So I was too embarrassed to send. <laughs> no worries. It would be great to get it though. There was a lot of good information in there. Um, do members have questions? Representative Sevilla. Yes, thank you for your testimony. Very, would be helpful to have that. Um, so uh, <clears throat> the goals, uh, work on the Global Warming Solutions Act. Yes, yes I am a climate counselor. Yes, you are a climate counselor. And I did work on passing that. I think it was a very important piece of legislation. Yes. And I think about um, that. If I could go back uh, to when we passed that legislation, um, there was, I think we did not include enough of a focus and a mandate on ensuring um, uh, adaptation, and I think we've talked about this. So the Global Warming Solutions Act puts our emissions goals into statute and has us create a plan that drives us towards those emissions goals. Uh, for me, there are pieces in that plan that <clears throat> really uh, required us to look at uh, adaptation in rural life, 
um, and, and for Vermonters, so that we really had to focus on that. But that was not part of our goals, the adaptation uh, to climate change for Vermonters. And so when I think about this, I'm thinking with that lens. So this has goals for conservation, which I agree with. But it is, it, it's, uh, it is a concern, not concerned. I wonder, I'm wondering about how we can include some of the things that we're hearing, some of that, some of the opposition to this bill is around concerns about people's livelihoods or, you know, their land. And so how we can include more uh, centered, goals, some goals in here around Vermont, Vermonters um, way of life and adaptation. I, this is not coming out very well, but we've spoken about this issue that I had, not issue, concern that I have about GWSA. So I'm, I'm bringing that forward. So I want to make sure that when and if we pass this, that we have done that for this, that we've said to Vermonters, okay, and here's where you are. So this is, you know, macro about our biodiversity which of course benefits all of us but you know we're hearing from people who are afraid that their way of life is going to be impacted and so just recognizing that in this and speaking to it you know uh, maybe reassuring folks in it so I just putting that on the table as someone who has been engaged in this work for a long time and who I have worked with before that that is something that I'm thinking about it, was that clear? It was clear. I don't know that I heard a question, but I have a response anyway. Great. Great. Um, so I was appointed by the Senate uh, to represent strategic, um, gosh, I have like the longest title technically in the GWSA, but it's essentially expertise and resilience. Uh, so this is near and dear to my heart. I do think that it was um, not a fatal flaw, but a flaw of the Loring Solutions Act that there wasn't more focus and attention to strategic planning around adaptation for uh, for climate change for our Vermont communities. That said, the reason that I was appointed to that position and the efforts that I tried to, um, to navigate with partners and other counselors was to really understand or to explain so that there could be group consensus or understanding around how important natural system conservation and restoration is for our community resilience. And that's why I think that this bill, I think the shorthand is like a biodiversity and community resilience bill, that protecting land is like the most um, land and water is one of the things that we can do that meets climate mitigation requirements. So sequestration and storage in Vermont is huge. Uh, we can probably get around 27 to 30% of the way to our climate mitigation goals just through carbon sequestration and storage of our forests. Uh, Headwater storage, like I said before, is, is significant and profound to reducing downstream community flooding, uh, which we know flooding is the number one hazard that faces Vermonters. Um, and then beyond that, just having the access to natural natural outdoor spaces proved huge. A UVM study during the like early COVID days found that public, uh, public health and public mental health significantly improved with people who had access to the outdoors. So it's 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 a silver bullet as far as I'm concerned in the climate conversation. Um, I don't think that, I think that I would have a hard time understanding necessarily how this would have a significant impact on uh, Vermonters and their way of life. I believe that through a really well facilitated planning process that really only like benefit can be had through understanding what conservation of our land will look like and all the benefits that be, might be realized through it. I mean, I, I would agree with you. And uh, and I still believe that the Global Warming Solutions Act was the right thing to do. Uh, yeah, totally. We have a bill on our wall to repeal it. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the, the our ability to really bring this down to, you know, my sixth grade neighbor, you know, I, I mean, I, I invite folks to help us bring it to that level at, in reassurance and explanation. There's, you know, some of the things that I have been trying to gather. I'm new to this. This, you know, many members of this committee have done this a couple times. Um, <clears throat> you know, just the terminology being really consistent. You know, I find it myself that, you know, we are a little loose with some of the words or it feels like it to me. It's hard for me to kind of say, okay, well, what? 
specifically do we mean here? So the more that we can bring this to the sixth grade or neighbor level, the faster and easier it will be to get this passed, I think. So I think the goals are really important. It's just explaining it. I rather happily don't have a Juris Doctor, but my understanding of the current version of this bill is that there are uh, three defined conservation um, categories, and then there's a clause in there that should there be through the development of this plan with you know key partners and stakeholders uh, of interest in changing or adopting new pol new conservation categories that might come to light. I think that makes there's enough of um, there's enough leeway or movement in there to make sure that that conversation doesn't have to necessarily be hashed out over years and years in this city, that it can be had with the people who are closest to, the, to it and recommend the best available science and data to inform a statewide conservation plan. Would you support um, putting in here um, in the findings uh, or maybe in the findings um, statement about the um, importance of maintaining working um, lands. I don't think that that's specifically in here um, for working forests. Um, the, um, that Vermont, uh, maybe we put a 40 by 40 in here, 40,000 homes by 2040, you know, uh, that, that all of these things can exist together, which is, I would like to be telling my folks that we can do all of these things. Yes, I'm not in competition. Yes, and they are not in competition. I don't think that we spell that out as well as we could. Okay. I would have to see the language before I could say whether or not I would support the, its inclusion or not, but. Other questions? Thank you for your testimony. Yes. I think we'll take a, a, another seven minute break and we <laughs> at quarter past 11 for our final witness of the morning. All right, we are reconvening our meeting and continuing the conversation on H-126, and we're going to welcome Peter Gregory from the Two Rivers Out of Beachy Regional Commission. Welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate being invited in to talk about this bill. Um, for the record, my name is Peter Gregory. I'm Executive Director of the Two Rivers Out of Beachy Regional Commission. We serve 30 towns uh, in uh, uh, northern Windsor County and most of Orange County. I'm testifying for Two Rivers, um, not necessarily VAPTA, the Association of All Regional Planning Commissions, although VAPTA has discussed the bill and uh, its position is much like uh, that from uh, David Snedeker and his uh, testimony. So in short, uh, Two Rivers supports this bill and we ask that this bill be uh, passed out and, and adopted and, and put into law. We're very, very excited about the planning process that's contained in the bill. Um, I think it'll, uh, the plot process, planning process will help answer some of the questions that people have had, will help with the education that's necessary, and will kind of hash out some of the, um, some of the concerns and, and potential fears you've heard uh, in the past you know, weeks that you've had testimony on this. Two, Two Rivers supports a bill for a number of reasons, and I'll just mention them briefly. Uh, we've had a long history of support and activity in outdoor recreation and trail development. Uh, the uh, economic benefits of, of such, the um, emotional and, and physical health benefits of outdoor recreation, clean water. We've been a, a very, very active in, in working on clean water issues and basin planning with the Agency of Natural Resources for, for literally decades. Shoreland protection issues, we've been involved in those in the past. Disaster mitigation and resilience, uh, you know, flood storage, uh, reduced runoff, those kinds of issues. Uh, that's certainly been um, a huge part of our work and all regional planning commission work, uh, even before uh, Irene hit uh, some a decade or more ago. Um, working lands, we understand the impact, the economic impact of our working lands and continue to support that in our planning. And then the climate goals uh, and sequestration and the benefits uh, to conservation for addressing those issues. I mean, I could just keep going, but those are all issues that we work on and uh, have developed uh, strong policy statements in our regional plan. <clears throat> so our regional plan was adopted most recently in 2020. They have a life of eight years, as you know, but we tend to 
readopt and improve them every few years because life is changing so fast and the issues that we face are so interconnected uh, that we can't learn fast enough and and then articulate a policy direction um, in eight years. It has to happen more frequently. But we have strong policy statements around forest resource areas, you know, flood resilience, wildlife, surface water quality, hazard mitigation and resilience, scenic resources, wetlands, to name just a few. So all the benefits to uh, conservation planning and implementation uh, are strongly supported by policies in my adopted regional plan. So I have no hesitation in coming before you and saying, my board supports this bill. My 30 towns adopted that plan unanimously because of all the reasons I just mentioned. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's a slam dunk as far as how important this is to what we do. We were created by the legislature many years ago to address not just road development or housing, but all these issues. And every couple of years, there's a brand new issue that we're, we're facing. And it all seems to come together at the regional level because we are implementing state and federal policy while also working for and with our communities and trying to uh, mesh it all together. So one, you know, 120, Six is important because of the land use implications and what we have been for, um, enabled to do under the statutes. We've been very aggressive in fighting sprawl uh, in our regional plan and our regional commission. As some of you know, it's been more on the uh, retail end of things where we have identified retail only being uh, allowed in built up settled areas. Um, not along highways, not at interchanges, uh, but that's just one aspect of the sprawl issue that we're dealing with. We're also dealing with residential sprawl uh, and the fragmentation issues that come with that, the energy expenditures that come with uh, living far from workplaces, um, transportation issues, all, all those. But this bill advances much of the work we do regionally with our municipalities. Um, so again, that's, that's, you know, none of our communities um, are, are surprised at all because we not only use our plan with all its policies and regulatory proceedings like Act 250, but also in our approval of local plans. So having a strong regional plan that is specific, that uses mandatory language, uh, coupled with a good educational uh, component, um, improves local plans over time. So it's, if, you're, if you're taking your town plan approval process seriously. Um, so we've been able to make great strides, but there's always more to do. Um, so this is a good discussion to have, and I'm really excited about being part of the planning process that's envisioned and articulated in this bill. Uh, we need that. We have housing discussions, we have flood discussions, we have transportation discussions, but we have not had these discussions as detailed as they need to be, given the benefits that you've alluded to, to a good robust uh, conservation program. We've heard that VHCB will have a role in this. Um, Vermont is incredibly fortunate to have created VHCB, uh, what they do and the talent that they have attracted to that organization. So uh, I, I support that fully and um, uh, look forward to working with them and this committee and all the stakeholders in the process. So um, with that, I'll, I'll stop and take any questions you might have. Thank you for your testimony, Representative Smith. Thank you, thank you. Um, when you review town plans, do most town plans address conservation of their forest lands? Uh, is, is that part of a town plan? It, it is if they want to um, get approved an approved town plan by the Regional Planning Commission that was put in the statutes a few years ago, habitat blocks and, and you know, forest resources and things. So, you know, we've done a pretty good map, I think, um, at the regional scale. And then we go out to our communities and explain what it is, what it means, what it doesn't mean, uh, and then help them also address that. So. It's, um, it's an education process because it is a new requirement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're good discussions, but yes, uh, the towns uh, are addressing that and getting approved, approval from us. Good, thank you. 
Representative Simmons. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I spoke with another um, executive director of another RPC, this is maybe a couple of years ago. And this person said, you know, what's incredibly challenging is we do a lot of plans, but then people often only wake up when there's a permit or, um, you know, a proposed development project. I wonder um, if you have any thoughts about, um, first of all, do you see that too? And then second of all, um, if you have any thoughts in how to maybe move up that public involvement, because by the time you get to the permit project phase, you've got lawyers, it becomes, you know, contentious. Um, and these are really tricky challenges. Like, where are we going to put the people, but we also need clean water, but we also need, you know, energy, but we also want to have woods and forests. Like, so I can only imagine that this could become more contentious if we don't have, you know, a healthy, uh, robust discussion process for Vermonters. It's a good question. I think there will always be, you know, robust conversations, differences of opinion. Uh, no. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but let me say I have found at least in, in one small area here in Act 250 in, in our regional planning, our plan and our regional uh, involvement in Act 250, it's gotten much better as our plans have become more specific and less wishy-washy. When we started using mandatory language, and we started actively participating in the process, we found that developers that in the past didn't know about us, didn't care about us, didn't read the plan, and then got blasted in the process. That's not happening anymore. I'm, I'm seeing them come to us first. I'm, I'm seeing uh, lawyers and engineers that have been hired by developers um, say, you ought to look at the regional plan. And our advice is that this might not be the way to go. So we're seeing, a lot less, I think, the better the planning is. Um, you see a lot of that uh, in the housing uh, field. As a town zoning, you know, says you've got, you know, this area can handle 12 units and stuff. And the developer, before even comes he or she comes forward, you know, drops it down just to try to get through the system. And that's not fair, and that's not right. And there are some bills going through the, the, the uh, legislature right now to change those kinds of things. So expectations are different and it's not just a fight at the permit stage. Um, so yeah, I think um, there's plenty of room for improved regional planning around the state. And there's definitely plenty of room for better local planning. And as we say, when we work with our towns, you know, say what you mean and mean what you say. Don't say we would like to encourage this on Sunday when the sun is out and everybody's happy, but that, you know, this is not right. And this is what we do want. So. It's a, it's a hard sell because the culture, as has been discussed earlier today, is, is strong local control. But let's not kid ourselves. Uh, strong local control does not um, save resources of statewide um, value. We have gone, I think, as far as we can, as far as, you know, voluntary, you know, let's all hold hands kind of process. And I think the time has come on a lot of these issues, either for public safety reasons or public health reasons, uh, we're a little more prescriptive, and we we recognize that there's a state role or a regional role, and it's not just 256 towns going in different directions. I work for towns. Luckily, you know, um, my towns and the officials know, you know, how I feel, and 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 um, you know, so this is not new to them. But it's 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 out there. But I think that's what we need. Further questions, Representative Sackowitz. I was wondering if that brings up an interesting point. And I'm wondering about maybe if you can just comment upon the, the relationship between local control in this context and the municipal capacity to, you know, conduct such control. Oh boy, yes, that's a, that's a very good question. One that has been discussed quite a bit this session by the administration as well as as members of the legislature. Local capacity is is very strange right now, um, your local official. Um, staff turnover at the local level is, is at a degree I've never seen before. We're being asked as an RPC to backfill on municipal services and, and staffing uh, quite frequently. And we don't even have the, the capacity to respond to those town's needs. And that's, that's a, 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 is um, a shame, but 
there's a lot of turnover too on the um, volunteer boards, planning commissions and zoning boards and stuff. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a growing problem. Um, I'm not sure how to solve that, quite frankly. You know, we're, we're doing all we can to help uh, towns meet those unmet needs, but uh, even towns that have the, the know-how to administer grants and to do that kind of work, they're short-staffed. So it's not like nobody knows how to do it. It's, they don't have the time to do it. So I don't know if that answered your question, but uh, it's, it is a problem. It is a problem and I don't have a quick solution. Thank you. Other questions? Not seeing any. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Peter. Yeah. Good luck. Excuse me. Um, right numbers. <clears throat> Why does this always happen? <laughs> um, so we are. Uh, it'd be great to get any more thoughts. I have. Kate Warner was suggested as a witness on this bill earlier on the uh, Trust for Public Land study. Um, and a couple of other people still on our list. If you have thoughts on witnesses you want to hear from, please bring them to me. Um, that would be great. And so where we are, so yesterday we started markup on household hazardous waste with Michael O'Grady. Um, and he'll be coming in tomorrow afternoon at 1.15 uh, to continue that. Hopefully we're moving towards um, a vote on that bill. And uh, I, I don't know if it's, this is universally known, but we have tomorrow morning after the floor, we have a training. Um, and I can't remember the title of the training right now. Sexual harassment. Is, we had that yeah, it's, it's, we've had that. It's discrimination. Discrimination. Discrimination, yeah, discrimination thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so we won't have any committee time tomorrow morning, but at 1.15 tomorrow, we'll meet here with Michael O'Grady. And we're back here this afternoon at 1.15 to get Vermont Conservation Design with Bob Zeno. So continue the H126. And so tee up your conservation design questions while you eat lunch. Representative Smith. I'd like to, you may know who, who I could ask or someone might know. The state of Vermont and the federal government, when they clear or go into a forest that they own and remove hardwood <coughs> and firewood. Who gets it? Oh, is, it it's, is it sold or given to uh, low low income families, or does it go to the state? Or um, as far as I know, the larger timber sales are, they go up to bid uh, on the federal lands. So Vermonters don't get an opportunity to buy any of it. Well, I don't know. It depends on who's. Uh, it de it, I wouldn't say they don't get an opportunity to buy of it directly from the feds. No, you can get a permit to collect firewood on the forest, for sure. You go and get an individual permit to collect firewood, um, but that's different from a larger scale timber harvest. I know that. Uh, I'm trying to say. I think it's Slidic in. I guess I don't know where it is. It might be in Morgan, but. They're going to be logging a lot of firewood out of there. It, it would be nice if Vermonters would be given the opportunity to, to cash in on it to heat their homes. Is that federal land? Is it state. State. I will, I will yeah. state. I don't know what the state policy is, but we could, uh, you know, you know who to ask. I, I mean, I would reach out to the commissioner, the interim commissioner who's who's been in here. Yeah, that's what I'll do. That. Right. And on one more note, uh, for the bottle bill, I would like to have uh, our local. Main Redemption Center. His name is Butch Thompson from Thompson Redemption. Uh, he's in Derby. I'd like to hear what he's got to say about the model. He's, he's got the biggest facility in the area, but it's not big enough. And I'd like to know what his take is on the whole thing. Did you say the name of his business? Tom? Thompson's Redemption. Okay. Great. I can get a phone number if you want. That would be great. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Others? Um, so I would like to hear from the ski areas uh, and someone on uh, agriculture um, on this bill. I think we did hear from VLCT, right? Um, I, thought we heard heard from Karen. I thought we heard from Karen. I did, but we can see if it was on this bill. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. That <laughs> that's I think it might have been on broadband. Okay. <laughs> Actually, yes. 
and noting that we're still waiting on AMR and the definition of permanent conservation. Um, oh, and I just wanted to note that yesterday my comment to the um, traveled um, here had used that lifelong Vermonters. He had been responded, so I would be happy to share that with folks. Sure. I just was wondering, is it, did you say that any someone from Casella will be coming in to testify? On the bottom. Yes. I don't know if you. Yeah. I said yes, and but thank you for the reminder. <laughs> so we're putting that together right now. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah. She's on our list. Okay. Kim Cross. Thank, thank you. All right. Um, with that, we will adjourn until 1.15.